Our next speaker believes that products are a reflection of the cultures in which they were created. A coach and a strategist. Please welcome the Chief Experience Officer at Tin Drum, Alicia Naples. Thank you so much for inviting me back to Design Up. Like Katya, this is my third time being on the stage at a Design Up event. In fact, we have done all three of our Design Up events together. So for me, Katya is as synonymous with Design Up as Jay, Narayan, Shiva, the whole team. Um, but it is such an absolute honor to be back here. Thank you. Um, Two years ago, I did my first design up in November 2017, and for many years I had dreamed of coming to India. And that came true when I came here to give a talk called Beyond the Screen. Um, how many of you saw my talk from... Yeah, okay, great. Um, that moment represented the beginning of a journey for me. Before we flew to Bangalore, my husband and I gave away almost everything we owned, and we came to India with one bag each and a one-way ticket to Bangalore and four nights booked in a hotel. And that was all we knew about the future. Um, in a lot of ways, being on the stage right now represents the end of that journey. Because for the last two years, we've traveled around the world, meeting people, talking to people, doing work, taking in culture. And at the end of this year, we're going to settle in the Netherlands. So this talk is, in many ways, a continuation of Beyond the Screen. It represents the evolution of my thinking based on what I've learned from two years living on the road. So Beyond the Screen explored what happens when our computing landscape shifts from two dimensions to three dimensions. Mixed reality, which I define as a mixture of virtual and augmented reality, will eventually replace screens in our lives, which means that our physical and our digital data will coexist, coincide, and co-mingle, and cohabitate. This computing in your eyeballs, as I tend to call it, is more primitive and visceral than any kind of user experience you have ever experienced before. And so it's really important as we work in this medium that we design products with the long-term health and safety of our end users in mind. Because when we forget about the needs of the human who will use our products and services, we find ourselves dealing with a lot of unintended consequences, which was one of the big themes of Beyond the Screen. Another big theme of Beyond the Screen is love and belonging and their importance in society. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of you. Um, I really love this community. And you have all made me feel so welcome um, and made me feel so loved and seen. And I just want to say thank you because it's a really special thing. So thank you, all of you. All right, we're gonna stop talking about the past now. The last part of Beyond the Screens was called How to Get It Right. And it focused on two big ideas that would help you to avoid falling into unintended consequences. And the first was the separation of form and essence. In that talk, the way I described the difference between form and essence is that if you talk to users and ask them what they want to do in an augmented reality headset, every single one of them will tell you, I need to send a text message. I need to send a text message. I need to be able to text my wife. I need to be able to text my mom. But if you think about it, when you're wearing a headset, one of the hardest things to do is input type. You don't have a keyboard. Microsoft's AirTap thing is amazing engineering, but still not very fun to use. So the form of the feedback that you're receiving is, I need to send a text message. But the essence of that feedback is, I need to be able to communicate asynchronously and easily. And that may have nothing to do with text. It might end up being short sound bites. Tell mom that I'm on my way, right? Um, and so the form is exactly what you're told, but the essence is what's being really told. 
And so today I want to take a look at form and essence from our field as designers. So we spend our time using different tools and doing different things. Some of us push pixels, some of us draw wireframes, some of us kern type, some of us sculpt materials, some of us define spaces and experiences. Our tools and processes are quite diverse, but the essence of being a designer is a desire to make something better. We all chose to pursue this field. Um, I can't remember which speaker, but somebody earlier today said, nobody went into design because their parents told them to, right? We chose this field. We chose this profession. And we chose it because we want to make something better for someone somewhere in the world. The essence of designing is harnessing simplicity, beauty, utility, and authenticity to maximize positive impact. You've seen this phrase today already, I know, but um, the second part of how to get it right was to ask the right questions. In Beyond the Screen, these questions had to do with not getting hung up on technical specifications, but figuring out other things. But today, I have a different set of questions for you to ponder. In September, I was having lunch with a friend, and she told me this story about how she went to this meditation workshop. And her teacher said to them, I want you to think about sitting well, sorry, he told them all to sit down and to close their eyes, and he said, picture yourself in front of a beautiful lake. Picture the lake. Feel the trees, like be in that, in that situation. And then the teacher said, as the thoughts arise in your mind, picture them as sailboats, just gliding across the lake effortlessly. Just let them go, like the sailboats. And then he asked the profound question, what is the wind that's moving the boats? What is the wind? And by this, what I mean is, what is your motivation? Why are you putting this in the world? Why are you making this decision? Are you motivated by fear or greed or love or compassion? What is the sustainable choice to make? And when I say sustainable, I don't just mean materials and garbage and the waste cycle. I actually mean sustainable to humans, to our mental health and to our societies. What is the compassionate choice to make here? What is the wind? Every person in this room and every person in the world is significantly more complex than any product we have ever created. People are three-dimensional objects. We contain bodies, minds, and hearts. The bulk of the data that we collect and work with in tech exists in the mind because it's the easiest thing to quantify. When we rely heavily on models that equate human beings with the data we collect, we ignore the body and we deny the existence of the heart. And this, my friends, is the root of unintended consequences. It's deep and pervasive, and of course, this is baked directly into the business model that powers technology. Profits are valued, Quantified data is sellable, so that which is measurable is imbued with value. But most of the things that we value the most in this world, like love, like connection, like fulfillment, these things are fundamentally unquantifiable. And so by prioritizing only that which can be measured, we have systematically devalued the only things that matter. And the effects of our passion for the material and measurable can be seen and felt throughout our societies. The frantic pace of our lives does not allow us time for introspection. So we tend to focus on what we can automate, what we can aggregate, what we can make faster. Without the time and space to digest and internalize, our experiences become a series of memories expressed as posts 
and photographs rather than integrated wisdom. By devaluing the subjective and the personal experience and knowledge that we gain throughout life, we have been left in a state of alienation from our true selves and from nature. Our greatest human achievements have not come from the intellectual realm alone. The things that are lasting and beautiful have been created when people engage their mind, body, and heart as complete three-dimensional beings to make something that's universal, beautiful, and true. The prioritization of mind over and often at the expense of our bodies and hearts is one of the first things we need to connect. I'm sorry, correct, so that we can connect. The big problems that we're facing in the world right now are not going to be solved with our brains alone. We need to learn to think in all three dimensions. Our minds solve problems and connect patterns while our bodies move and dance and our hearts feel and love. And it is all of these things together that make us human. And it is only when we begin to support the totality of this experience that we will actually begin to thrive as societies. So, if your work relies on the exploitation of other people, it will not bring you happiness. I'm sorry. I don't care how much that big tech company wants to pay you. If your work relies on the exploitation of other people, it, that work will not make you happy. Each person's future is tied to every person's future. And every person's future is inextricably tied to the future of our planet. We can no longer pretend that we can destroy the planet without destroying ourselves. Okay, I promise it's not all doom and gloom. And I understand that the scope of these problems can feel like incredibly oppressive and overwhelming. Like, let's solve global warming and then we'll bring peace in the Middle East, like sure, and then we'll have lunch. Um, but these are not problems that are actually going to be tackled with large solutions. They're going to be tackled with tiny solutions because the balance and fulfillment that we feel in our individual lives is reflected in the impact we have when we reach out to make changes in the world. The way that we feel better collectively is to start feeling better individually. So if you want to change the world, you have to start with yourself. When we're unfulfilled, we feel empty. And emptiness feels terrible. So we go looking for something to distract ourselves from the pain. This is called numbing. It can be alcohol, drugs, shopping, sex, social media. It doesn't matter what it is, but all numbing behavior has consequences. It may feel really good in the moment to eat that donut, to buy those shoes, or to go back into Twitter, but all numbing behavior steals our attention from the present moment and leaves us, once again, empty, which starts the whole cycle rolling. When you're unfulfilled, you go into situations looking for praise and validation instead of searching for opportunities to make an impact. Internally, you're asking, what about me, instead of what do you need or how can I help? Until you're able to take responsibility for your own fulfillment, your presence won't have the same impact that it could have. It won't have the impact that you want it to have. And fulfillment requires you to focus on what really matters to your body, mind, and heart, to set aside unrealistic ideals and perfectionism in order to be authentic to your true self. It's not about being perfect. It's about being honest. It's about being you. And so to get there, you have to let go of your baggage and remember that real freedom is not the freedom to pursue our petty, trivial desires. It is the freedom from our petty, trivial desires. Investing your time and attention in fulfillment gives you more in exchange than just money. It gives you the opportunity to be of service. 
So following your own path requires you to take care of your own needs first. This isn't selfish. In fact, what this is doing is saying, I can take care of myself so you don't have to worry about me. Because when you lack nothing yourself, then you can truly help. This commitment to service models the sort of behavior that will inspire your children and the people in your communities to follow their own paths. Authenticity travels in ripples, like a meme spreading from person to person. Its effects are exponential. This is simple, but it's not easy. And it takes a significant amount of courage. Living authentically means casting off other people's expectations, and that can cause some disappointment. But if you're unwilling to disappoint someone else, you are absolutely going to disappoint yourself. I'm going to say that one more time. If you are unwilling to disappoint someone else, you are going to disappoint yourself. And when you do that, you diminish your impact and you end up empty again. The kind of problems that we're facing as a global society right now require us to stop focusing on our differences and start working together. A bright future is one that honors the shared dreams of humanity while celebrating the strength that comes through our differences. The change that we want to see in the world will be led by the people who have the courage to invest in themselves and their communities. So let's make sure we're giving each of our personal dimensions the care and attention that they deserve every day. Because once we're solid in all three dimensions, then we can really begin to connect. The American author David Foster Wallace opened his commencement speech for the 2005 graduating class of Kenyon College with a joke. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way. He nods to them and says, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a little bit, and then eventually one of them looks at the other one and says, what the hell is water? This is actually one of the right questions to be asking. What the hell is water? The point being that one of the greatest privileges in life is being able to choose how you perceive the world around you, rather than simply going with the default response that your brain cooks up in the moment. When experiences show you new ways of seeing or challenge a belief that you've held for a long time, they can encourage us to perceive and appreciate and even enjoy all of the things that we take for granted. I am definitely gonna run over time. I apologize, it shouldn't be too bad. But I'd like to highlight two different immersive media experiences that happened in London this year in 2019 as examples of how we can use technology to visualize connections, enhance presence, and explore the spiritual world. The first is called We Live in an Ocean of Air. It's an immersive virtual reality experience that was created by Marshmallow Laser Feast. It was on display at the Saatchi Gallery in London for six months, beginning in December of 2018. Ocean of Air is a 12-minute immersive experience that uses our most universal interaction with the environment, breathing, to reveal and illuminate the invisible but fundamental ties between plants and animals, between you and me, between us and the world. Harnessing the transportive power of VR, this piece takes you to an ancient forest to interact with the largest organism to ever exist on Earth, the giant sequoia tree. Within the experience, you can step inside the tree and watch as it converts water and sunlight into energy and air. There is a breath sensor attached to the headset, so as you breathe out, you see the air coming out of your body, mingling into the environment around you, and then being absorbed by the other people in the room. You see that air is something that the tree is giving us, that we take in and put out and share with one another. 
it's an absolutely beautiful and connecting experience to see the way that this is our water. And we totally take it for granted. We don't think that the air that was in my body is going to be in your body in a minute. But of course, that's exactly what happens. It goes through all of us. It connects all of us. And if this experience did nothing more than visualize the air and make you think about the medium that we pass through in our lives, it would be a tremendous triumph. But Ocean of Air does so much more than that. After experiencing this, I felt profoundly grateful. I felt intensely connected to the planet, to people, to the environment, to everything. I was so, so grateful as well to the creators for making such a beautiful, emotional, and educational experience that encourages people to think about our dependence on and responsibility to the organisms we share our planet with. In addition to building connections, this piece builds trust. It builds trust in the universe and in one another, but it also builds trust in technology. It's not trying to sell you anything. It's not trying to scare you. It's not trying to control you. It is a kind, gentle, connecting experience, and its existence will do a lot of good for the perception of virtual reality in the world. Unless you think that this is just like a bunch of hippies making some weird art in London, um, We Live in an Ocean of Air was wildly successful. It was extended three times, and it was sold out to the end of its run, but there was another show that had to go up, so it had to come down. It was seen by over 20,000 people in the course of its run. This shows that there is actually a real need and a real desire for these sorts of slow, connected experiences. Regardless of how you feel about her art, the performance artist Marina Abramovich has a keen eye for need and what's going on in the world. And her recent work has, not coincidentally, often featured a strong thread of connection. Her most famous work, The Artist is Present, directly addresses the rarity of being seen. You can dismiss it as saying what she sat in a chair for three months, um, which, yes, that is kind of what she did. But it misses the key point of just how rare it is to have somebody's undivided attention these days. The Life is the most recent new work by Marina which continues her exploration of energy and presence by removing the physical artist completely and replacing her with a fully three-dimensional photorealistic holographic avatar. This piece was presented at the Serpentine Gallery in London in February of this year, and it was my honor to serve as the experience lead on the small team that built it. I never show my work on stage. Um, so this is a little bit weird for me. Um, the way that it works is 30 people at a time wearing magically mixed reality headsets go into the main gallery of the Serpentine. In the Magic Leap headset, you can still see what's going on around you. It doesn't block out your view. So all members of the audience can see the other members of the audience. But that's all the technical stuff, and it's not very interesting to me. What is more interesting to me is everything that goes on around it. No phones were allowed in the space. It was requested by the artists that it be a quiet, contemplative place for people to go. Every attendant, including the techs who worked on the hardware, were trained by the Marina Abramovich Institute. Every person brought a calm, gentle, and deliberate energy into the room. There was always a human available to guide you, and physical connection was a huge part of it. The fitters put the device on your head, then you're led in by the hand and placed around a circle. This piece ran for a week. We had 5,000 guests come through in one week. It went from being a complete secret to totally sold out in nine hours. There is a vision of the future with regard to virtual and augmented reality 
that is all about hyperstimulation. More and more flashing lights, more and more bombardment, more and more and more and more and more surveillance, advertising, you name it, it's all there. This is the future that a lot of tech companies are driving toward, whether they know it or not. But what the life does is radical by comparison because it is slow and deliberative, deliberate and contemplative. It refuses to participate in the battle for your attention. It is suggesting that we use all of this technology not to speed up, but to slow down, to spend more time thinking deeply about the nature of our connections to each other and to the universe. I'll go quick on this. On, on a personal level, the things that I was most excited about, about the life, were the two demographics that really loved this piece. They were older women and children. If you work in mixed reality, you know that basically all people talk about are what 18 to 34-year-old males want. But this was a piece that appealed to people that are outside of that demographic. And I personally found that really, really rewarding. The biggest demographic that came to the life were millennials. I honestly was really scared about asking people to give up their phones. I thought that millennials were gonna like attack me like a big posse of mean girls and take me down. But in fact, the millennials were really happy to hand it over. Several of them said, please take it when I asked for their phone. The place where I got a lot of static about taking phones was from the over 50 crowd and particularly men. We're currently in talks to tour the life globally, and I'm really excited about this because I think that giving access to people around the world this experience, I think that it's potentially life-changing. I think it, it takes something that generally only went to the very privileged. Like, could you go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York to see Marina? I couldn't afford to go. I'm guessing most of you weren't there, but now there's an opportunity that you can have these kinds of experiences too. And that should be the role of technology, connecting a product to a need. The things that our children are wanting, vulnerability, authenticity, focus, and presence, these are the very tools that we can use to repair the societies, the fabric of our societies. We need to leverage all of our knowledge, ability, and love. We need to stop wanting to be right and start wanting to be useful. We need to stop focusing only on material gains and start prioritizing emotional health and safety. We need to be ready to listen and learn. We need to be compassionate toward one another, but most of all, we need to be compassionate toward ourselves because we're all going to win or lose together. This is not East versus West. It is not me versus you. It is not us versus them. It is all of us against the worst parts of human nature, the fear, the greed, the inertia, the hate. And it is not just our future that's at stake here. There are 8.6 billion, with a B, species on this planet, and we, together, represent one of them. And we, together, are endangering all of them. We are beautifully imperfect three-dimensional creatures that are capable of great things. And if we have the courage to do so, we can be more than the sum of seven and a half billion parts. And to that end, I want to leave you with one final question. A question that has gotten me through a lot of dark times. A question that has motivated me when I felt that I'm too scared, or that it's too big, or that I can't. So when you feel like maybe you can't, just ask yourself, what if I did? Thank you. Thank you so much.